All right, welcome to our next video in Intro to Malware Reverse Engineering. We are doing the labs out of the textbook Practical Malware Analysis by Michael Sikorsky and Andrew Honig, and we are working in our Windows XP virtual machine to do so. We have our Lab 7-1 binary all loaded up in IDA Pro, so let's go ahead and start off with the questions. First question is, how does this program ensure that it continues running, that is, it achieves persistence, when the computer is restarted? Now, we know from the textbook that there are multiple ways to do this. We saw a malware sample a couple of labs ago that used a registry key to do so, but that is not the case here. If we look in our main function, we can see right off the bat the start service control dispatcher A. Now, this is a function that needs to be called by any Windows services, and it basically tells Windows, yes, I am a service and I have started. So we know that this is establishing itself as a service, but we do not know yet how it has done that. Let's go ahead and jump to this subroutine right here. And if we scroll a little bit, we can see right here is where it creates itself as a service. Now, it will do this every time the program is run, and you can see that create service takes a lot of parameters. You can see them listed here. Each one of these corresponds to a value, and you can look those up in the create service A documentation. But this is creating the service. We can see it gives itself a display name. Some of the more interesting parameters are the desired access, the service type, and the start type. And that information can be found in the create service documentation. But this is how it achieves its persistence. It creates itself as a service. And a service is essentially a background program that runs with Windows. It does not open any interactive windows. It has no windows, dialogues, anything like that. It's just designed to run in the background while you are doing other things on the machine. Moving on to question two, why does this program use a mutex? Well, first of all, how do we know it's using a mutex? If we scroll back up into this subroutine, we can see open mutex A and create mutex A. First thing that it does is it is going to try to open this mutex and this parameter right here is the mutex that it's looking for. It's just a string that is unique to this program, and it'll call the open mutex to try and open that. And then it will test and see if it has been successful. If it was successful, it will return a one. It will ignore this jump if zero, because one is not zero, and it will call exit process. So if it finds this mutex, it will exit process. If it does not, it will jump down into this second area right here and create the mutex so that the next instance of the program will find it and exit. So why does it create the mutex? It creates it to make sure that it is the only program or the only instance of this program that is running. Next is, what is a good host-based signature to use for detecting this program? A host-based signature is just something that is present on the machine that you can look for to see if this malware has been installed, if it's running, and we have two options in this case. We can look for the service that it has created. We can go into the Windows Services list and look for the service. And if we scroll back down here, you can see this malservice is the name that we'll be looking for. And we can also look for this mutex. The mutex will be present if it is running, and the service will be present if it has run. And we can also use that service to see if it is currently running. It'll show the run state. But those are your host-based signatures. What is a good network-based signature for detecting this malware? If we go back through and analyze this malware, we will find out what it does but without spoiling the ending we can just go to strings and see if we see anything that looks like a network call well yes we do we have this malwareanalysisbook.com and any traffic to this website is a pretty good host based indicator and we will see later on in the lab what it does 
with this address. Next is question number five. What is the purpose of this program? So we'll need to go through and dive in and do a little bit of analysis and see what this program is actually doing. We know that we open the main and then immediately jump into this subroutine. So let's walk through the subroutine and see what we can figure out. So we are looking for the mutex, exiting if we find it, creating it if we don't. We are opening the service manager and we are creating our service. This uh, git module file name A just gets the file path of the binary that's running and it is used as the parameter to create the service. So it's not creating a service with another binary, it is just telling itself to start whenever the system starts. Now we're doing a lot of stuff with dates here and uh, we'll come back through and look at this a little bit later in the lab, but just suffice it to say that we have dates that we're working with now. So we are establishing a date, we are creating a wait time and then waiting for that time to happen. Once that time has happened, we can go and create a thread. And once we create that thread, what are we doing inside of it? Well, we are moving this value into the ESI register. Let's go ahead and convert that to base 10 because we are not computers. And we can see that 20 is moved into the ESI register. For what purpose? Well. We can scroll down and find ESI. This is a decrement call, so a minus one. And right below that is a jump if not zero. So we are setting the value 20. We are doing things. We are subtracting one from that ESI register and checking if it is not zero. If it's not zero, we jump up to this location here. You can see the dotted line. And this is a loop. This is a conditional loop that will happen 20 times. So whatever this code is that we are doing, we are doing it 20 times. And we are creating a thread. And that thread has a start address. Whatever is inside of this start address will be created as a thread, and there will be 20 of them happening all at once. If we double click start address, we now see that code. This code down here is what's going to be happening 20 times. We can see that we are opening an internet call, opening an internet URL, and that URL will be that malware analysis book. Now we have a nice bold line going back up here, and we can see that we have a location and a jump to that location. This is an unconditional loop. This will just keep going and going and going and going. So we are loading this URL, and then doing it again. This is what's referred to as a denial of service attack. It's a fairly basic one. When you load a web address, the server that's serving that web address will take a little bit of time to do that. If you do it over and over and over from many machines, let's say that you have a piece of malware that will, on a specific date, tell all of the machines infected with that malware to load this address over and over and over again, that website will more than likely not be able to handle all of that traffic. There are more sophisticated ways to do denial of service attacks, but this is the easiest and most basic way to do it. So we are creating 20 threads. Of those 20 threads, we will be opening that URL just over and over again, hammering it until it goes down and not much else. So that is the purpose of the program is to conduct a coordinated time-based DDoS attack. Now, speaking of time, the sixth and final question is, when will this program finish executing? This took a little bit of work on my part and I did have to go back to the textbook and step through with it to really fully grasp what was going on, but it made sense to me at the end. So at the very beginning here, we are doing an exclusive or of EDX against itself. No matter what's in the EDX register, that XOR is going to set it to zero. So this is a way of setting this register to zero, regardless of what was in it before. 
and we are going to memory addresses here. We are loading LEA, loading the effective address of this do time. And we are setting it in the EAX register. And then we are moving the value in the EDX register. So remember, this is zero. So we are moving zero into the year position of a system time zero into the day of week of a system time zero into hour zero into second and then finally we are moving this 834 hex value into the year again we are not computers convert it to base 10 and that is 2100 so the year 2100 the zeroth day of the week of the zeroth hour of the zeroth second so at the very beginning of the year 2100, we are going to kick this off. The wait, the create waitable timer, that is the value that's going into it. So it will wait until this specific date to kick off the DDoS attack. So that is it for the lab. Just uh, those six questions there. I think these are really starting to get interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing what the next lab is. We are really starting to dive into the actual functions of these malware. And I will see you on the next one.